So, I am continuing my conversation from last week about how during this time of war, we can together, right here where we are, wherever you are, we can bring peace into this world. Does that sound good? Yeah. All right, so that is what I want to talk about today. So, if you know me at all, uh, or have spent, you know, a, a certain amount of time with me, <laughs> you will know that I spontaneously, every once in a while when I see something is great or fantastic or excellent, I don't know where this comes from, but what comes out of my mouth is, it's the bee's knees. <laughs> it was a slang term from the 1920s. I have nobody around me says that. I have no idea where that comes from. I'm currently teaching a class on reincarnation. Maybe I should look into that. But, but you know, it's, it's, it's the bee's knees. Uh, and, you know, that made me, I started thinking about that. And, and, you know, it's kind of fun to look up popular phrases and words that have come into our culture because they're always a reflection of what is happening at the time, you know, politically, in music, in movies, in arts, you know, in, in pop culture. <clears throat> so I thought we would take a little journey for a moment through time, shall we? Stick with me, I have a point. So back in the 1950s, they started saying, be cool, cat. A hipster like you doesn't want to make a boo-boo. Big brother is watching you. Then in the 60s, okay, daddy-o, you groovy hippie. Go on, stick it to the man. And the 1970s reminded us that I'll catch you on the flip side, dig it? <laughs> then the yuppies came on the scene in the 80s and their tweens gagged it with a spoon. <laughs> That's okay, said the 1990s. I'm chilling while I wait for my fly looking homie. <laughs> Oops, my bad. No worries, said the 2000s. This newbie over here is my sweet new peep. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> That's the journey in a minute, right? This, this idea of adopting new phrases. This is, this is a reflection of our culture, and it is altogether normal. It becomes normal anyway. And I've noticed, I wanted to share with you, um, a, a new phrase that entered our vernacular. I, I, and I will confess that when it first came on the scene, at least here in the United States, it drove me bananas. I, I noticed that it became sort of popular in earnest towards the end of 2020, and it is now everywhere. This phrase is everywhere. It's on social media. I see it in interviews uh, from public figures. It's a phrase now that people are saying just before they get ready to say something important. You know exactly what I'm going to say, Shell. The phrase is, dun, 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 dun. If I'm being honest, I fill in the blank. If I'm being honest, they fill in the blank. If I'm being honest, we fill in the blank. I have to tell you, when this first started happening, I would scratch my head and I would be like, does that mean you're not always honest? <laughs> does that mean I should be worried? What does this mean? What does this mean? And it, it, it dawned on me, though, in thinking about this and in being with this, that here in the United States, to the degree which it's being used, that it's being used so often, unconsciously, I feel like it came out of our direct experience with COVID. We have all been forced to be brutally honest with ourselves about a lot of things, lo, these last two years. Anyone who has faced the possibility of death will tell you that. 
There is a yearning for real and deep, authentic and honest transparency so that we can have deep and meaningful conversations. When someone says, if I'm being honest, there's a natural sort of leaning in that we do, don't we? They're about to say something important. They are actually about to make themselves vulnerable. And so we lean in. And by them saying that, if I'm being honest, it gives them the spaciousness to be even that much more authentic in that moment. Do you understand what I'm saying? So many folks are saying that phrase now that it is starting to feel like a mantra almost. A reminder for every one of us to get really, really, really honest about what is important and to create the space to share that. The Trappist monk Thomas Merton wrote, love is our true destiny. We do not find the meaning of life by ourselves alone. We find it with another. After these past two years of isolation and of division that we are now beginning to come out of, we are all, every one of us, longing for honest connection and reconnection. So I was at Trader Joe's the other night, and I, I walked in. Have you ever done it when you walk? Like, they close at 9, and you pull in at 8.45, so I'm like racing through Trader Joe's, <laughs> and I'm grabbing all the things. I don't want to keep anybody, you know. I got up to the, to the, the uh, checkout counter there, and of course, I just said, oh, I just made it. Gosh, I, you know, I, I went as fast as I could, just making conversation with this delightful, delightful man at the counter. And as he's scanning my, my groceries, we just strike up a conversation. You know, he starts talking to me about his life, and we're chasing, well, how is your day going? And we're chatting back and forth, and in the, in the very short few minutes of him checking my groceries, he lets me know that he had just spent the past year as a crisis counselor, and he needed a break because it was so emotionally draining. He knew it was really important work, but it was so emotionally draining on him. He needed a break, so he was working at Trader Joe's sort of while he was just taking a breath, you know? And I, 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 here is this extraordinary human being who, who is sharing with me this incredible life experience and journey that he is on. And I did something I never do because I learned very early on it can clear a room very quickly. <laughs> I leaned in. We were in our masks, right? So it's all with the eyes. I leaned in and I said, I'm not a crisis counselor, but I'm a minister. And his eyes like froze for a second. And, I, and then I leaned in a little bit more and I said, a very liberal, very progressive minister. And he went, oh, okay. Like, okay, continue. <laughs> I'll listen. And I said, you know, I just want to thank you for the work that you did for humanity last year. It was so important. And I also want to applaud you for caring for yourself, being here, for taking a break, if that is what you need to do. And he leaned in, and he teared up, and he said, thank you. And then he said something to me that no stranger has ever said to me before in my life. He looked right, like, right at me like in my soul, you know when people do that, when you connect with someone like that? And he just said, I appreciate you. And I literally was... I, I can't even, I just, through the masks, that human connection, and I teared up. I'm tearing up thinking about it, and I said, I appreciate you. We're at the check stand at Trader Joe's, <laughs> appreciating each other's souls. And I grab my groceries, and off I go, and as I'm putting my groceries into the trunk, I'm thinking to myself, oh, wow, this life, what we are capable of. I'm going to share this on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
And I thought of it, and, and he so inspired me. You know, this idea that we can go out into our week and we can let people know that we appreciate them. We appreciate their existence on the planet. That is huge. I was, I was so intrigued by this idea, I actually looked up the etymology of the word appreciation, as I am apt to do. The etymology of the word appreciate means to rise in value and to fully be conscious of something or someone else. So when we tell someone that we appreciate them, we are raising their value in the world. That's how I felt in that moment. And we are fully seeing them. We all long for connection. And leaning into the practice of saying, I appreciate you is a way to do that. So this week, I invite you into it. Are you willing? Are you willing at home? Are you all willing? I appreciate you. I appreciate you, Reverend Masando. I appreciate the staff. I appreciate you, Shelley Walker, and you, Brian Harris. I appreciate all of you. I appreciate all of you at home. And I appreciate all of the beloveds that are on their way to us in whatever way, in whatever stage, in whatever part of life we may meet them, even if they are just simply driving past us on the road. I appreciate you. We can bring peace in the world by doing even just that. So we are currently in the Christian season of Lent. And for those of you who may not know, this is a period of 40 days, which comes just before Easter. And really, whether you identify as Christian or not, Lent is an ancient, powerful season of reflection. It's the time when we move from the darker days of winter into the spring. One of the original meanings of the word Lent was lengthen. And it's during this period of time that the days lengthen. They begin to get longer. Next Sunday is actually daylight savings time. Thank God. We're going to experience and celebrate our first day of spring and the spring equinox during this time of Lent. And this ancient time marks not only the new growth of that which has been latent under the soil of the earth, but of our new growth. This is a sacred ancient time of growth for us. I think of Lent as a season when we too are being lengthened, we are being stretched, and we are being grown. Traditionally, during Lent, Christians will often give something up for, for this 40-day period. They will fast, if you will, you know, from chocolate or caffeine or whatever. To, to fast is to abstain from something. I grew up Catholic, uh, and I remember as a kid, I always tried to fast from something that wasn't too painful like Brussels sprouts or broccoli? <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> For us in, in New Thought, we often look at this time as an opportunity to fast or to abstain from negative or harmful thinking, understanding that as the Buddha taught, what is happening on the inside directly impacts what is happening on the outside, our inner state of being impacts, directly impacts our outer state of being. And this is a very, very powerful practice. But for me this year, this particular year, this season of Lent, feels like it is asking us to be honest. And in doing so, to connect with one another in an even deeper way. We have been so isolated and have experienced so much division during COVID. And right now, the beloved Ukrainian people and their extraordinary bravery are reminding us of the preciousness of this life. God bless them. The preciousness of this life. So I had a, a new thought for myself during this season of Lent of 2022. 
what I'm going to do and what I invite you to join me into as peace builders is to abstain from withholding our love. Let's abstain from that. Yes. Yes. You know, this Lenten season, this time of lengthening and growing ourselves, it's an opportunity to fast, if you will, from retreating to our corner of the rain. In the Christian world, Lent is kicked off by Ash Wednesday, which we just had this past Wednesday. If you don't know, it's when the palms of the previous year turned to ash and those ashes are placed on the foreheads of folks. As the scriptural phrase, we are dust and to dust we shall return, is said. This used to scare the bejesus out of me. (laughs) Now I like to think of it as we are all stardust. And to stardust we shall return. Or as the beloved Richard Rohr says, we are all earth, and to earth we shall return. Because the whole point here is that we are all stardust. We are all earth. We are all each other. There's a quote I turn often to that reminds me of this truth. Valerie Kaur wrote, We can look upon the face of anyone or anything around us and say, as a moral declaration and a spiritual, cosmological, and biological fact, you are a part of me I do not yet know. You are a part of me I do not yet know. Just after Ash Wednesday, a few days ago, I reached out to a person that means a lot to me in my life. We have very different political views, and it's been a really tough two years. It's been really sad. Anyone? Anyone? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I have missed this person very, very, very much. And so I retreated from my corner. I took a deep breath. And I texted this person, and I just, I just said, hello, I'm thinking about you, I miss you, and I hope everything is okay in your world. And you know, as I was texting, I was shaking a little bit. That's how much it meant to me, and that's how vulnerable I was in that moment. And I didn't expect to hear back at all, and I was fine with that, I was fine with that. But this was my commitment for Lent for myself, to not withhold my love, to retreat from my corner of the ring, wherever that may be. So I didn't expect them to to respond at all. And just as I was putting my phone down, I saw the three dots bubbling. Do you know what I'm talking about when they're responding to a text? I couldn't believe it. And I was just like, was like, have you ever been in that place? You're waiting for the dots? You're waiting for the dots? Oh, the tears, the tears. To my absolute joy, to my absolute delight, they texted back. We kept it light, we kept it easy, but we expressed our love anyway. We expressed our love anyway, and what I know is that there was more peace in the world in that moment because it was internally within me, and it was internally within them, and therefore, it was was externally in the world. That brought peace to my little corner of my block where I live. Peace happens from the inside out, my friends. So just for a moment, if you'll humor me, I'd invite everyone and all of you at home, take a deep breath in, close your eyes, just for a brief moment, or you can cast your eyes downward if you're more comfortable. And I invite you to just bring into your heart a person in your life that you could reach out to this week. Not someone who may be abusive, that's not productive, but someone you may have lost touch with, 
someone you may disagree with, someone that you could bridge a, build a bridge with, someone that you just haven't connected with in a while that was important to you at some point in your life's journey. Maybe you can think of a few people. Just bring them into your heart. And now taking another deep breath in. And on the gentle exhale, open your eyes. I invite you this week to reach out to them. To not withhold your love from them anymore. Keep it light. Keep it easy. But express your love. Be peace in the world in this way. Are you with me? Yeah. Yeah. In doing this, we take responsibility and we... we we reach out and we do our part for peace, and it will help make the world a better place, one person, one text at a time. Activist Grace Lee Boggs wrote, you cannot change any society unless you take responsibility for it, unless you see yourself as belonging to it and responsible for changing it. Each one of us has an opportunity to take responsibility for changing the unrest in our own hearts, each one of us, so that we can participate in creating peace in the world. Now, I know that um, many of us are feeling the pain of, of the war in Ukraine. Our hearts go out to them during this unimaginable time. It's unfathomable, really, what's happening. And there is also, in the same breath, so much sadness for the Russian people who are now being cut off from the rest of the world and will suffer untold economic pain under Putin's totalitarian regime. I think, too, about, about the Russian soldiers, so many of them young teenagers, who we learned uh, this past week, many of them didn't even know where they were going. No one wants this war in Ukraine. We are still processing the, the deaths caused by the last two years of COVID. We want unity. The world wants peace. People want peace. And something struck me as I was watching the protests this week all over the world. I was reminded of our human need right now to connect with each other and to protect one another. I don't know about you, but I am feeling an enormous sense of wanting to protect not only the Ukrainian people, but the Russians and anyone who is impacted by violence or war anywhere in the world. It feels like something is being tapped into in this collective consciousness. Do you, do you, do you follow me? It's, it's a feeling like no other. Because everything was already so heightened during COVID. Our hearts were broken open. And because our hearts were broken open so widely, we are seeing this in a very different way. Watching all of this, I was reminded of the Native American protectors in 2016 at Standing Rock who reminded us in their wisdom by saying, we are not protesting, we are protecting. This week, when you see the marches and the vigils and the protests, I invite you into the peace-building energy of seeing them as protectors, stepping into the protector energy. And in that moment, that is a prayer request for every single one of us. We can all lean into that protective energy and surround them with our love. See it as one giant prayer. 
So I want to close this day with a piece from John O'Donohue's book, Benedictus. He wrote, As the fever of day calms towards twilight, may all that is strained in us come to ease. We pray for all who suffered violence today. May an unexpected serenity surprise them. For those who risk their lives each day for peace, may their hearts glimpse providence at the heart of history. That those who make riches from violence and war might hear in their dreams the cries of the lost. That we might see through our fear of each other a new vision to heal our fatal attraction to aggression. That those who enjoy the privilege of peace might not forget their tormented brothers and sisters. That the wolf might lie down with the lamb. That our swords be beaten into plowshares. And no hurt or harm be done along this holy mountain. <laughs>